we'll start. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, session, which I'm sure will be fascinating, looking at ending violence in the Sahel. Um, this is a, is a slightly unusual session, um, which I think makes it really interesting. And before I introduce the panel, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to hand over to Robert Mugger, who's the director of the Igarape Institute, who is going to talk us through what is an incredible visualization, um, which involves charts and photos and, and maps, um, which really will help set up and explain um, a lot of the what of the issues that are faced in the, the Sahel. So over to you, Robert. Terrific, thanks so much. Well, look, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're here to talk about the Sahel, uh, and the Sahel is a, an, an enormous area, spanning more than three million square kilometers from Senegal all the way to northern Ethiopia, more than 14 countries involved. We're gonna be focusing a little bit more on, on the Western Sahel, primarily the G5, the so-called Burkina Faso, the Chad, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, and a little bit of northern Nigeria. Um, but I think today's discussion is really to talk about this intersection between climate stress, uh, food insecurity, and violence, and the ways in which these can be self-reinforcing. And it's not a problem unique to the Sahel. This is an issue that many countries across Africa are facing, and frankly, that many other countries across Asia and the Americas are going to be facing. And I think the call today is to say that this is really the canary in the mine. Looking at the Sahel, a forgotten region in many cases, uh, is going to be a harbinger of what might come in the future. And I'm going to be drawing on Earth Time. Earth Time is a platform developed by the Create Lab at Carnegie Mellon, which takes together satellite data and then layers it with socioeconomic information across climactic and anthropomorphic variables. So let's start by moving to the next visualization. Uh, the Sahel right now, and particularly the Western Sahel, is experiencing an explosion of violence. And there are a lot of reasons for this violence. Often it's described in quite simple terms as extremist violence or as intercommunal violence or as criminal violence. The fact is that it's experiencing a whole range of different types of violence that are mutually reinforcing. And it's important to understand why that's happening. Uh, and I think climate has a big factor to play for it. The key issue in the Sahel is that it's squeezed between the Sahara to the north and the savanna to the south. It's an incredibly arid, dry area with a very long dry season and a very short wet season. And so over millennia, people have been moving up and across and around the Sahel through what's called transhumans. Basically, people moving their cattle or their goats or other forms of livestock from the dry areas to the areas for where the pastures are. Usually, it's a north to south movement, and it's seasonal. And the challenge right now, in the last sort of 20 to 30 years, is that transhumans has become much more frequent much more constrained, and the dry season's longer and the wet season's shorter. So we're seeing an acceleration of transhumans, generating new kinds of conflicts and tensions in areas where herders and farmers come together. And this is a dramatic shift in terms of the past, because it's not, there's always been conflict, but today we're seeing incredibly violent conflict, because the customary institutions that would regulate that management of land are breaking down just because of the sheer volume of people moving and the sheer range of, of climactic threats that we're seeing. Next visualization, please. So people like Ali, who are herders, are finding themselves often in tension and conflict with farmers that they meet when they move from the southern parts of the Sahel to the, to, sorry, the northern parts of the Sahel to the southern parts of the Sahel. This is a slide that shows temperature anomalies above the mean, uh, and it goes back to the late 1800s. And the key point here is that what's happening in the Sahel are extremes in temperature. Uh, climatic changes as a result of, of increasing temperatures. Right now, the Sahel is increasing in temperature at 1.5 times faster than the global average, which means that by 2030, we're going to see a temperature increase of between 3 and 5 degrees Celsius. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but in a part of the world where the mean temperature is 35 degrees Celsius, that's, and where people are living at the edge and on the margins, that's an incredible shift. And climate scientists, they agree on one thing, which is that the future is going to be dry, but it's also going to be incredibly wet. And that may sound counterintuitive. Uh, we're going to see the growth of the, the Sahara Desert. We're going to see increasing desertification. But you're also going to see changes in precipitation because of changes in climate, which are going to result in massive amounts of rain. And this isn't the kind of rain that's necessarily going to green the Sahel, although there might be some improvement. We're talking about driving rain, rain that wipes out land that's already depleted of nutrients 
uh, and, and it's facing chronic stress. Um, the FAO estimates that already 80% of the arable land in the Sahel is no longer fit for planting. Next visualization, please. So what we're seeing increasingly, this is a common site, are gr increasing stress on livestock herders who are essentially having to dispense of their cattle or shift to different kinds of animal stock in order to adjust to this climate stress. And this is, of course, resulting in shifts in prices. So the cost of food often oscillates wildly. Uh, and for people who you know, depend on a very fine uh, uh, sort of cost for food products, this uh, has incredibly detrimental impacts. Next visual tool, please. This is Lake Chad. And Lake Chad sits within the Lake Chad Basin. It's hard to explain just how important Lake Chad Basin is to this part of the world. Uh, this area, the basin itself, covers about 8% of the entire continent. Uh, and it straddles seven different countries that intersect it. And it's a meeting place, and it has been a meeting place for generations, for thousands of years, where people have gathered to basically water their, their, their crops and to plant, uh, to plant new seeds and, and to look after their livestock. But Lake Chad has lost 90% of its size in the last 60 years. Now, there have been changes over time. Over thousands of years, we've seen these kind of cyclical shifts, but never have we seen this kind of speed of drying up of a lake. 90%, which means basically, as you can see here, the red areas are where you've seen in the last 30 years the most intense drying, and the green is where you've actually seen increases in wetland in the marshy areas, which means that tensions are rising in this area. 30 million people depend on the Lake Chad Basin for their survival. It's a meeting place, but we're seeing more and more violence concentrated in this area. And a number of armed groups, and we'll talk about these in a moment, are taking advantage of these kinds of stresses uh, and beginning to inflame tensions and manipulate tensions in all sorts of insidious ways, generating huge amounts of violence. So we're seeing an explosion of violence as well as refugees and migration from this particular part of the Sahel. Vegetation uh, is also sort of oscillating in the region. What you're seeing here is that basically the coverage of vegetation, scrubland, uh, pasture land, uh, arable land, in green, and the red areas are where you're seeing drying. And the key point here is that there's always fluctuation. There's a very fine ecosystem that's balanced in this area. But because of the rise in temperature and the rapid speed at which that temperature is rising, the, gr the red areas, the dry areas, are becoming more and more prevalent than ever before. And two areas where it's really <laughs> causing some challenges are in parts of northern Nigeria, the so-called Middle Belt, uh, as well as parts of Mali. And as you'll see over the course of this time lapse, you'll see a reddening in the northern parts of Nigeria. And that is also where Boko Haram, which is a uh, sort of a, a, an extremist movement, has found its uh, stronghold. So it's no coincidence that where you see stress, where you see inequality, where you see food insecurity, you also tend to see more and more recruitment of young people uh, who, are, who are looking to armed groups as a source of livelihood. Next visual. So this area has been not long neglected, but that's not to say that there isn't development assistance. Uh, this is a, a, a visual tool that shows overseas development assistance flows over the last 30 years from the OECD DAC. Uh, and we're only looking at flows to the Sahel. Uh, you'll see that Europe and North America have been major contributors. But what's interesting over the last couple of years is that the, the, the breadth of donors has actually increased. Countries like Saudi Arabia, like Oman, Turkey, uh, and others have become really important and critical uh, donors to the region. But one thing to say about this is that although this assistance is often desperately needed and, and plays a really important role in keeping people alive, providing food assistance and, and all sorts of livelihood support, um, it's by, by and large short-term in focus. It tends to be focusing on the short-term uh, droughts and disasters and conflicts that the region faces, and it doesn't really focus on the long-term, not least on the greening aspects uh, of dealing with some of these underlying factors that are, are causing stress. And it's not just development assistance, it's counterinsurgency aid and military assistance that's also being funneled into the region. The Sahel is considered to be, in many ways, the new front line on the so-called global war on terror. Uh, and so you have a number of counterinsurgency operations underway, supported by the North Americans, by Europeans and others, uh, in many of the countries in, in the region. Um, and this is, of course, creating all sorts of new tensions where you have governments being supplemented with support, military support to crack down on the armed groups. And that, in turn, is generating new forms of conflict and tension. Next visual. And it's not just development aid or military aid uh, in terms of counterinsurgency. It's also weapons. 
This is from CIPRI, the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research. And what we're looking at here is arms flows of all types into the Sahel. Um, again, this is all intended to supplement local governments to be able to fight against armed groups, which is an important issue. Uh, and you'll see it's not just North America and Western Europe. You'll see China, you'll see Russia, uh, you'll see Bulgaria, Romania, a whole variety of players who are uh, supporting the activities. The challenge here is that because you've got a number of weak governments in the region, a lot of these guns and weapons end up going walking. So every illegal gun starts its life legally. Uh, and unfortunately, when you have weak controls over your stocks and inventories, a lot of these weapons turn up in the arsenals of the many, many armed groups in the region. It's not just legal guns, it's illicit trafficking as well. Um, the region, as you saw with the transhuman slide, has a large number of different corridors through which all manner of goods and services are being transferred. Illicit weapons are just one of the many types of commodities that are moving. And when one country experiences a challenge, such as, say, Libya, uh, during the NATO intervention and, and the implosion of that country, weapons can flow all across the continent. And this just gives you an example of just some of the flows that we're able to track in the region. So all of this creates a kind of combustive cocktail. Uh, and so-called terrorism or acts of terrorism have become much more common in the region. Uh, you'll see over the last 20 years from this data set provided by the Global Terrorism Database, sort of a, 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 a rapid rise in parts of Mali uh, and parts of Niger and northern Nigeria is sort of the key hotspots. There are multiple groups, and it's really important to stress this. It's not just so-called terrorist organizations, be it ISIS or Al-Qaeda uh, or Boko Haram, but there's all manner of militia groups, political armed groups, uh, you know, paramilitary style groups. This is one of the defining challenges of the 21st century when it comes to conflict, which is the metastasis of violence, but also the proliferation of armed groups, which makes it incredibly difficult to mediate and come up with meaningful solutions because of the fractious nature and the constant fragmentation of these groups. And you can see these hot spots sort of emerge over the last 20 years. But it's not just terrorism. There are at least four kinds of violence we're facing and that groups like the ICRC and governments in the region are facing. The, I mean, terrorism is, is one aspect, but we're also facing intercommunal violence. The tensions between farmers and herders mm -hmm. in parts of northern Nigeria, parts of Niger, Mali, in some cases are far larger in terms of their humanitarian consequences than so-called terrorist organizations. Uh, people were killed, more people were killed last year by farmers and herders in those kinds of clashes and by Boko Haram in the same year in northern Nigeria, just to give you a sense of that kind of interplay. So you also have organized crime, which is increasingly becoming an issue as drugs are being moved up to the soft underbelly of Europe, as well as human trafficking. All of these kinds of dynamics are, are mutually reinforcing and generating uh, some spectacularly challenging uh, humanitarian consequences. The hotspots, again, and we're very fortunate to be here with the foreign minister of Mali, are very much in Mali uh, and northern Nigeria and Niger. And violence isn't just metastasizing and spreading internally and domestically. We're seeing it spilling across borders. Uh, and so one challenge in a neighboring country can generate remarkable challenges in the next door neighbor. Uh, and this is a, a, an immense difficulty for governments that are already struggling with uh, an array of development challenges. Explosives and mines are, of course, a legacy of conflict everywhere. Uh, this data was provided by uh, a group that's dedicated to collecting information on landmines and IEDs, uh, unexploded ordnance. What you see is also the spread of the use of different types of, of weapons that have a long legacy. One landmine in a farm pasture can eliminate the possibility of that land being harvested for generations, so long as one landmine is left and they're incredibly challenging to take out. So we're just seeing a legacy of conflict that far exceeds uh, just the short term. And I'll close here. More violence, uh, more tensions, uh, also forces people to leave. In uh, all throughout Africa, you know, you're, you're given an option in many cases when conflict comes to your front door. You can stay, as many do, to try to look after your land or your household. You can flee, or sorry, you can join an armed group. Um, if that's the only opportunity to provide some meaningful income to your family, uh, or you can flee. Uh, and so we're seeing a, a, a spectacular growth in refugees in the last four to five years from the G5 countries of the Western Sahel. Uh, an important point to mention here, the vast majority of these refugees are not moving to the developed world. They're not moving to Europe or North America, as is often portrayed by our politicians in the West. Nine out of 10 are staying right at home, mm. close by in a neighboring country. Uh, and putting unimaginable stress on institutions and governments and civil societies 
uh, and food production systems in neighboring countries. And what's not on this map, of course, are internally displaced people. There are at least five to ten times more people who are internally displaced and not leaving an international border but experiencing refugee-like conditions uh, and maybe don't receive the same kind of protection and assistance as refugees. I'll end here. Let's move on one more. So aid workers, and I'm going to sort of end on the second last, one, one of my last slides. Aid workers are, of course, one part of this puzzle who are trying to provide, in many cases, life support, life-sustaining assistance and relief and, and development. But aid workers themselves are increasingly implicated. Aid workers who work for the ICRC, who work for IRC, Mercy Corps, all other manner of aid agencies, especially national organizations as well. And they're finding themselves on the front line. So we're able to see increasingly in Mali and Niger uh, the increasing vulnerability and exposure of the aid world to these kinds of tensions. It's worth mentioning also that Blue Helmets, peacekeepers, are also on the front line. Mali today is considered to be one of the most dangerous places for Blue Helmets, for UN peacekeepers on the planet, who are increasingly being drawn in to many of these conflicts. I'll just end here. The ICRC is one of a number of organizations, and we're lucky to have Peter Maurer here who's going to be telling us about their experience, who have increased their operations over the last 30 years across the region, and I expect we'll be doing more of that um, and bring a tremendous amount of experience to the table when it comes to talking about these challenges. So I think that's enough for me. Back to you. Thanks very much, Robert. That was uh, I think everyone will agree that was pretty fascinating. Let me introduce myself um, and then I'll introduce the other panelists. Um, I'm Simon Robinson. I'm the regional editor at Reuters for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, and next to me is, um, as, as Robert mentioned, Peter Maurer, the president uh, of the International Committee of the Red Cross. We're very privileged to have uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Mali, Kamisa Kamara, um, to join us as well. And I'd like to begin with you, Minister. I think that we hear about um, violence in the Sahel only from time to time, at least in the West, when something big happens, when there's um, a, a massive attack from it or a, a, a kind of ramped up insurgency. But it seems that over the last, especially couple of years, this has been um, an area of the world that uh, is in crisis much more than we realize. The, the level of violence is increasing, not decreasing. Um, what, what is it like on the ground? What are you, what are you seeing in, in Mali? So, uh, well, thank you for the great uh, presentation. It's really, um, uh, it's painful uh, to see it uh, on a map like this with uh, red spots all over. Uh, but the reality is, is um, very much so. Um, I think that what really struck me from your presentation are the structural changes that you mentioned, and this is what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, climate change is one aspect of violence that is quite ignored um, in the Sahel. We don't really uh, talk about climate change as one of the main reasons, and in my opinion, uh, climate change uh, is one of the main reasons why we're seeing this um, spike of violence in the Sahel. Um, while you were presenting, I was thinking about uh, the current crisis that we're facing in the center of Mali. I've read many uh, reports from international media about what's happening in the center of Mali. We're talking about interethnic violence, how people hate, hate each other. And every time I'm like, well, I wish I could speak to you. I just don't have the time to do that. But uh, the reality is, um, is uh, much more complicated I think uh, the presentation you just gave is, allows to explain uh, what happens. When you see uh, climate change uh, in, in such a big region as, as the Sahel region, this uh, um, influences the way people live on a day-to-day -day basis. The center of Mali, for example, is, um, uh, I would say, a laboratory of uh, the Malian society as a whole. You have many, many ethnic groups who've lived together peacefully for centuries. And they've been able to do that thanks to um, some customary laws that they've established so that the Fulanis can, uh, who are um, uh, herders, could live peacefully with uh, farmers, uh, which were from a specific ethnic group. And then you had other ethnic groups specialized um, in fishing and, and other socioeconomic activities. When you include climate change uh, in a region like that, then herders are trying to live. They're trying to 
they're trying to make sure that they have uh, enough uh, funds and resources to feed their families. If herders um, are not able to do that through their specific socioeconomic activities, they're going to look for other socioeconomic activities that will allow that. Well, what they do is they will walk on other ethnic groups' uh, socioeconomic activities. And then you have tensions that do escalate and that have existed for centuries, but again, that have been able to be solved thanks to customary laws. Now you have national laws that come on top of that that are not able to face the structural changes um, uh, in, in this region, and then you add the jihadist threats, weapons, and you have this cocktail of craziness that creates the, the violence that we're facing today. I don't actually remember your question, <laughs> but um, what I can tell you it, is that the structural changes that mm. we're seeing in the Sahel can very much explain um, the very complicated violence situation that we're facing now. Robert, thank you. Robert, do you see, the Minister mentioned climate change as being central to all this. Um, in, the, in that kind of complex interplay between the jihadi groups, um, climate change, migration, <laughs> poverty. I mean, is climate change the kind of key factor here in the last decade or so that, that's changed the equation? Well, I mean, I think the, it's important to remember that the, the climate change has always been a challenge in, in the Sahel. You've always had these major shifts. Um, and, it, it, you know, there are mega droughts that occurred in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s that lasted 100, 200, 300 years. Right. Uh, so, you know, and, and I think it's important to reflect on that. What is different in the last 50, it, when you compare to the previous, say, two, 300, is that pretty much every year, the last 50 years, there's been a drought or some kind of severe drought mm. in one of these G5 countries, uh, with the exception of maybe three or four years. So we're, we've seen a, 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 quite a shift in, in recent times, and I think that's, it is an important factor. But you can't say that there's a linear relationship specifically between, say, rising temperature and terrorist groups or terrorist violence. You can say there's a series of pathways which may aggravate those kinds of tensions. So, you know, and it's fairly obvious. I mean, rising temperature um, leads to depleted crops uh, or, or loss of access to aquaculture or um, livestock that die. Uh, that generates all sorts of economic and financial stress because you're looking to buy products in a market where essentially prices are inflated. Um, that's aggravated by elites and others locally who are taking, seeking to be predatory and seeking to take advantage of those kinds of conditions, uh, at which point then people have, a, often young people, have a choice. You know, and it's, it's either you leave uh, or in many cases you join an armed group because that's often the only game in town. Um, and it's not necessarily motivated by some deeper ideology or some jihadi motive, or uh, it's often motivated simply by a desire for socioeconomic uh, returns. Okay. And it's important to remember one thing. One thing is, you know, to remember with Sahel, this is a region where life expectancy is about 49 years old. In Africa, it's about 59. The global life expectancy is about 70. So life is short. And it's got one of the largest and fastest growing youth populations on the planet. The mean age in the Sahel is about 22. Right. So you've got a huge youth bulge, low life expectancy, few options. Uh, and armed groups, I think, have come in and taken advantage of that right. in many cases, often at the behest of political actors, in many cases, just predatory organizations. So the results of that, Peter, from a humanitarian organization's point of view, I think there's well over 30 million people in that region who are food insecure, who are, who are struggling to get enough sustenance uh, that they might need every day. Um, and then obviously the rise of the jihadi groups leads to violence, which um, affects local populations. What do you see in terms of the humanitarian impact? Well, I wanted to echo what uh, Camisa has reflected upon as well. Uh, we, we see all those factors coming together and superpositioning itself in quite impressive graphics. Uh, in the reality on the ground, this is, this is explosive mix impacting and uprooting people. Uh, what we have seen over the last couple of years is uh, quite important population displacements which at the end are the result. And population displacement in an already fragile context means that you need to intervene with emergency measures that just uh, sustain the minimal lives and livelihoods of people. And so I think the, the problem is, if, if I understand the graphics correct, and also what Camisa has reflected upon is, 
that we, we just trespassed the tipping point. We, we can just have individual events here and there, but it is adding up to a trend. And it's adding up to important population displacements. So it creates a group of people which is extremely vulnerable and basically dependent on social services which cannot necessarily be delivered by the state for everybody, in particular in a conflictual context like, uh, like Mali, has to be substituted uh, by international organizations and is difficult to, to sustain. So uh, the, the needs landscape is exploding. Uh, there are one or two things which strike me. Robert has mentioned this fragmentation of armed groups. That's a particular challenge for an organization like ICRC. We are still here with our core mandate to ensure respect for minimal behavior with arms bearers in situations of violence and conflict. So just mathematically, it's one of the most mind-boggling regions because of fragmentation of the armed groups. You don't talk to two armed forces here. You are talking to a multiplicity of armed groups on which you have first to find out where they are, how they are structured, who is calling the shots, who is eventually influenceable uh, in terms of uh, behavior in the battlefield, respect for the civilian populations, respect for humanitarian organizations. Mm -hmm. So it's just the, the, the fact that humanitarians are most vulnerable and targeted as they help the, the vulnerable and targeted population is also an expression of this multiplicity of group. And maybe the last point, uh, once you go into basic life-sustaining life humanitarian emergency operation, you also recognize, and it has been mentioned, uh, you, you have to give a perspective to people. If you don't give a perspective to those uh, who are displaced, uprooted, wait for social services, and are unemployed, their basic three options are either they join an armed group, uh, they go into banditism, or you offer them something which is productive and that's the reason why over the last two days I have not uh, I have been emphasizing so much and how important it is to get income generating activities to displaced vulnerable people in the Sahel it's the best promise you can build on to somehow stabilize the situation and return to something better. It doesn't solve climate change. It doesn't solve a lot of the other problems which are there, which need a much more differentiated policy mix to respond. But it is one of the most powerful tools to bring to a, such a vulnerable situation in order to give a perspective to youth, to the uprooted, to the vulnerable in this situation. I want to come back and talk about some of those solutions. Um, Commissar, I want to ask, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen a, a, a massive expansion in foreign military uh, presence in your part of the world, uh, since basically since 9-11, but particularly in the last 10 years, right? So we've got American bases, we've got lots of French bases all across countries like Niger, like. Uh, Mali, we have German bases now. Uh, is that helping or is that hindering? I'm putting you on the spot, I know, by asking that, but is that helpful? So it's, um, it's an easy and it's, it's a difficult question that you're asking. It is helpful in the sense that it is building the capacity of our military to face um, new and growing threats. Threats that we didn't know existed 20 years ago, threats mm. that we didn't know existed 30 years ago. So it is very helpful in that sense. Um, the issue that we're facing in our uh, countries in the Sahel is that the uh, over uh, militarization or the focus on military assistance that is pushed upon us by the international community is um, one that we don't necessarily need. Right. Um, it does contain violence on the short term basis. Uh, Mali, for example, has 22% of its budget going towards defense. Mm. This is to uh, the detriment of the education of health, basic mm. services. Um, so we are trying to reform, for example, for example, our institutional framework 
to make sure that our social uh, services are closer to the population, but how do you do that when uh, you're asked, and this is being pushed upon you, to increase military um, and security throughout your country? Uh, it's a dilemma that we're facing on a, on a daily basis. Mm. Um, I think that, I mean, you're right to say that we're a very young population. 70% of Malian population is under the age of 30. This is mind-boggling. And then you have to make sure that they have an education, mm. that they have perspective. This is something that you mentioned. Perspective is important. Mm -hmm. um, you have youth that are increasingly on social media. What they see are other youth from other parts of the world who go on vacation, um, who uh, earn diplomas, who right. find jobs. They want the same thing. Of course. Um, and as a state, as a government, you have to be able to show that this is possible and, and it's something that they can look forward to. Um, in our case, very sad mm. uh, situation indeed. Robert, clearly, sorry. I, I, I just wanted to echo uh, the dilemma aspect that Kamisa is highlighting, and we see it a lot. When I visited Mali for the first time six years ago, uh, you see the huge difference in the military buildup. You can't go to a place in Mali without a garnison type mm. of security outfit at the fringe of the city. And so I, I just wanted to mention one more element, which is really an element of concern, that on the one side, as Commissar said, it's bringing a certain level of military security to a place uh, which has been insecure because of the attacks. But on the other hand, it's also creating a lot of difficult interaction with the civilian population, because the militaries are at the same time objects of attacks from the different groups. And to the extent that they mingle with the civilian population, the civilian population becomes an attack, uh, an object of attack. So I have been struck by to see this dynamic uh, when I visited a couple of days ago and to see how difficult the management of a big security buildup in a civilian environment is uh, at the present moment apart from the cost that you... But you can't do without that, right? Yes. You, you need that stability, you need that security <coughs> if you want to talk about development. It's, a, um, it's one of those big dilemmas. Yeah. Robert, even if one or all the, the presence of these military bases um, and, the, and the foreign forces and the uh, extra money that is going into uh, the national uh, militaries, even if they were able to tackle the, uh, the kind of jihadi groups, and clearly they're not doing that that well at the moment, it, it's much more complex. And one of the slides that you presented, which I found most interesting, mentioned the fact that in Nigeria, I guess, over the last year or maybe a couple of years, in fact, more people have been killed in clashes between herders and pastoralists than by Boko Haram, right? right. So that, that's not a really a military thing. That's, that's people, as they have done for centuries, coming down during the season, and then clashing with locals. Uh, often portrayed, I know, I know I'm a journalist, but in the media are often portrayed as a religious thing, right. as, a, as an ethnic thing, and clearly there are some elements of that, but, but more than anything, it seems to be about livelihood. So the, the, the presence of, of foreign military isn't really gonna deal with that at all, is it? No, and I think what was emphasized over and over is that balance is needed. I mean, you're gonna to need to have some kind of monopoly on the use of force if you're gonna maintain a certain integrity of law and order. But you also need to supplement that or at least you know, have an overwhelming emphasis on social and development investments in the long term. I mean, it's obvious. I, I think what's happening in Africa, I've spent a fair bit of time in the last couple of years, most of my life actually, working in, in, in many parts of Africa, but most recently in my last trips through the Congo and CAR, Central African Republic and Mali uh, and Niger, uh, is that the nature of, um, first of all, the great game over Africa is shifting. Uh, you're seeing new players, new actors coming in in all sorts of ways, and old actors in a way moving out or shifting uh, their, their footsteps or their footprint. So for example, you know, Russia and China, and I can say this because I'm an independent researcher, but Russia and China are making some, some real advances in some parts, setting up bases, whereas France is relocating and, and the Brits have sort of pulled out, the Americans are playing a, a multiple games. So I think it, it's a dynamic. Uh, situation right now. The old <clears throat> orders are coming unstuck, as they are in many other parts of the world. And Africa, in a way, is feeling some of the echoes and aftershocks of this reorganization, restructuring of some of the global relations, uh, number one. Number two, what I find 
sort of most disconcerting these days is that the nature of conflict as we understand it as an armed sort of government against a, a, an insurgent or a rebel group um, with sort of some relatively clearly defined expectations about conduct, uh, even if those were re regularly flouted, uh, with the aspiration of the rebel group to assume power um, and perhaps to assume the role of government. That's, I mean, if, even if it never really was fully the case, it's certainly not the case today. What we're talking about uh, are very blurred conflicts, conflicts in which, as, as Peter had mentioned, where over 50% of conflicts today, of the 40 ongoing conflicts in the world, including those in Africa, have more than 10 armed groups. 20% have over 100 armed groups wow. operating simultaneously, number one. Number two, the motives are all over the place. I mean, we've sort of as analysts and, and researchers tend to divide it between greed and grievance, right? There are right. people who are motivated by the desire for profit and securing rents from whatever the goods are, uh, whether it's cattle or livestock or whether it's uh, you know, resor mineral resources or, or, or wood. Uh, or grievance, that is to say political discrimination, people who've been left out of the social contract. Uh, right now it's that and much more. Mm -hmm. You'll see conf people motivated by multiple um, expectations, whether it's desire for profit to put food on the table in the morning, whether it's uh, motivated by some cleric who's, who's given them some aspiration, whether it's um, some sense of honor and, and having been aggrieved in a historical uh, political grievance that extends back 20, 30 years. You're seeing mixed motives and often shifting. And these blurring, uh, of course, this is all tied to global commodity chains uh, and linked to kind of larger issues about the global economy. Uh, but these bl this blurring is being absolutely taken advantage of by local elites um, who are using it to advance their own uh, aspirations. So it's not like this is just path dependent. Mm -hmm. There are actors and, and key nodes in that network mm -hmm. that are actually taking advantage of some of these situations and making a bad situation much worse. So, and the big challenge thing for the aid community is that often we don't talk about these kinds of complexities when talking about aid. The focus is very much on delivering a service, delivering food, delivering, uh, restoring a school, uh, building a road. The issue of politics and the complex nature of how politics aggravates and exacerbates violence on the ground, coupled with this impact of climate change, it's just something that is seen as, has often been seen as unpalatable, something that people don't want to talk about, right. not least governments in the region, but also international and foreign donors. If we're going to get serious, we have to have that conversation right. and really reckon with that complexity. Um, okay. I want to open it up, not just yet, but in a few minutes to questions um, from you guys. Um, I want to talk a little bit about solutions. And Camisa, one of the kind of solutions really to I think what Europe sees as a crisis of, of refugees entering um, Europe uh, has been this agreement between African countries and, uh, and European countries, which fundamentally, as I understand it, seeks to, um, f to stem the, the flow of, of refugees, which is one outcome of some of what we've been talking about, by helping the countries in Africa, right? By giving extra financing, um, to, to attempt to, to, to stop what Europe perceives as a, as a crisis? So um, the issue of immigration is a, it's a sensitive one uh, in the Sahel region, and, and specifically for Mali. I'm actually a daughter of, of immigrants. Um, we're not trying to stem or uh, to prevent immigration. We're trying to make sure that immigration becomes regular that people who decide to immigrate, immigrate um, and uh, are treated fairly when they do so. Um, we're also trying to make sure that when they go to those countries, they have specific objectives that they want to, to attain and that they have uh, the legality to do so. Um, there are many aspects to immigration that we're trying to, to tackle. Um, some people who do immigrate are shipped back to their countries. Uh, we're trying to make sure that when they come back, they have a place to come back to, that they have funds so that they can invest in their countries. But I mean, the, the reasons uh, uh, for which those people do immigrate are the ones that we, we mentioned. Right. No perspective. Right. Um, they are trying to have a better future for their, for their kids. Uh, they're trying to immigrate. But one thing that I would, add to, uh, would like to add to uh, what uh, you just mentioned, about the international help, international aid, mm. are that we currently have 19 uh, Sahel strategies that are Im being implemented wow. in the Sahel by inter the international community. Mm -hmm. Nobody here can come and tell me <laughs> that those 19 strategies do make sense. 
work together, are coordinated, and that right. everybody agrees on what the agenda is. This is untrue. Um, we have solutions. One of them uh, for us is the G5 Sahel. Uh, the five Sahel countries, or Western Sahel countries, Niger, Chad, uh, Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, Mauritania. Uh, and Mauritania, are working together so that their intelligence services do work together, their police services work together, right. that we have an, a development branch that also works together so that when, for example, the UN mission lives in Mali, we have something that is homegrown, that is sustainable, uh, that we can lean on so that our issues are uh, uh, tackled, that our young people have jobs, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of the many solutions that we're trying to, to find. But I have to say, 19 Sahel strategies um, implemented by the international community that has to write reports back to the, their uh, countries, donors, organizations to say that they're doing great things in the Sahel doesn't help. So one solution, in a sense, not to the, the, to the, the huge problem, but maybe is coordination of help. The help that's coming in, which is obviously needed at some level. Coordination of help, but also listening to the needs on the ground. The are homegrown right. solutions. When I hear um, criticisms about the G5 Sahel, I want to scream. This is a homegrown solution right. that comes from five Sahel countries right. who have sit down together, mm. who have decided that this is what they want to do for themselves. We know what we want for ourselves, yeah. and I believe the international community and, should support that. And the international community is always very ready to say, well, the solution, you guys need to work on a solution. They can hardly criticize when you work <laughs> on a solution. African solutions to African problems. Right. Robert, what are the, 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 the kind of complexity of the solutions that we need to, to look at um, are kind of mind-boggling, right? We, we talked, Camissa talked a little bit about the, um, the youth in her country, the, the size of the, of the young population. Um, we know that the uh, temperatures are rising more of the world than they are uh, the global average, one and a half degrees faster, right? Um, the population is increasing quickly. You know, where do you begin? I would defer to my colleagues really on, on that. I mean, I, I, but from superficially, I mean, and, and in the interest of time also, because I think we want to open up for a conversation, um, I think there are probably a number of priorities. and. and Clearly, mitigation, adaptation are absolutely essential on a global scale. I mean, this is something that's been a theme of the Davos event, but uh, there is a link between greenhouse gas emissions, aerosol emissions, changing currents off the Atlantic coast, and then changes in temperature in the Sahel. Uh, that's been demonstrated, and it's clear that we need to have much more effort on mitigation. Uh, the watchword that we have in, in, around the world these days is really resilience, building resilience within communities to both mitigate and adapt. Um, on the ground. And there are lots of ingenious uh, and, and wonderful and exciting innovations that are happening. I mean, these are extraordinary people who are dealing with great adversity. Um, and so I think the starting point is, what are the ways that we can build in, at a minimum, greening solutions in our development so that we can start, in a way, in strengthening the, the, the resilience and, and the coping capacities of people on the ground in the agriculture and livestock industry. And that means drought resistant tree strains. That means livestock that can cope with certain kinds of changing temperature. It means right. maybe adaptation of inputs and fertilizers. It means thinking about aquifers and how to have more, sort of rethink about local s solutions for managing water resources, but perhaps enforcing them in new kinds of ways. Okay. Uh, it means creating common and collective resources. I mean, I'm, I'm, what I'm struck by is if you go to Northern Mali or if you go to parts of Southern Niger or, or parts of Northern Nigeria, a well, a well that's solar powered or a pump that's you know, run on renewables can have an unbelievably transformative effect on a community in terms of developing a common resource. It can employ youth. Mm. Uh, it can create a sense of purpose in a community that this is a, something to be looked after and, and to have custodianship over and can have a transformative effect on lives and livelihoods in, in real time. In the, the app, and I'll just end on this point, We've developed a story, three stories, using EarthTime that all of you have access to right now on your mobile phones. If you just go to www.earthtime.org, uh, there are a series of stories. And one of the stories is called Solutions in the Sahel. And it was developed in partnership and in, in collaboration with the ICRC and a number of partners on the ground uh, in, in, in various countries in the G5. And it just sets out a couple of basic sort of lessons that are emerging from the region that need to be scaled dramatically. I think that the big storyline, the punchline, at least from my side, 
This is a part of the world that absolutely needs more attention than it's currently getting. It absolutely needs to be having local solutions to local problems. Uh, it definitely needs global support and a coordination that, that doesn't result in a manifold myriad of different you know, plans. Uh, but we have to get serious about it. And I think right now we're not. Well, I, I played around with the app uh, or the website yesterday, and I urge everyone to have a look at it. It's fantastic. Uh, let's move to questions from the floor. We have just under 15 minutes. so. We'll begin, we've got a mic um, up the back here. There's two questions, um, the woman at the end there and then the man in the front row here. Um, thank you very much for an amazing session. It's been um, fascinating, <coughs> but my, I wanted to direct my question and comment to Minister Kamara. Um, uh, I'm Debbie Stothart from FIDH, the International Federation for Human Rights. And uh, two months ago, we produced a report on civilian populations in central Mali caught between terrorism and counterterrorism. I understand this is a result of the April uh, forum and in which Minister Kamara also uh, very much aligned with the recommendations that came out of report. And it, it was... Uh, it gave me, brought me joy to my heart when you actually criticized the international pressure to, mili to have a militarized response. Um, and, I'm, and I wonder, from those recommendations, which are very, very detailed, there was one about security sector reform and, um, and addressing impunity, particularly uh, in, in terms of civilian protection. I wonder how far you've been able, to, well, <coughs> the government has been able to progress with that and how much the international community has been able to support that process. Did you read that report, um, Minister? I always read um, FID <laughs> reports. <coughs> Um, so I used to be part of civil society and I used to support FIGH, FIDH, so I know you very well. Um, so SSR, security sector reform, we uh, started our SSR reform back in 2013 and two years later we were asked to uh, start a DDR process as part of our uh, peace agreement that we signed in Algiers. Doing uh, security sector reform at the same time as you're doing a demobilization, demilitarization, and reintegration process is a complicated um, uh, situation. The human rights aspect that you're, you're mentioning um, is key, uh, and it's actually the one that uh, gets the most attention. We don't want to be in the media every day. We don't want our military to see that in the media, whatever efforts they're putting on the ground um, are actually undermined by the human rights violation. This is something that we don't want to see. We, this is something that our military doesn't want to see. Uh, we have special courts in place to take care of uh, the uh, allegations of human rights violation in the center. We're working very closely with Human Rights Watch, uh, which I'll uh, compiles reports regularly, speaks to civilians about the violations. This is unfortunately something that we cannot really avoid in any uh, conflict situation, conflict war zone situation, you will have human rights violations. Our job is to make sure that our military are trained, that they understand what a human rights violation is, that they understand that there are repercussions to that, that they understand that human rights violation undermine every effort that we're making. Even at the government level, how do you engage with the international partners when you have um, human rights violations that you have to quote unquote justify? Um, so this is a, an issue that we take very seriously and um, our uh, Ministry of Defense, of Justice, work hand in hand together to make sure that whatever recommendations um, just came out of your report are actually implemented. Thank you. This gentleman here and then I think we'll have a question over here. Thank you. Uh, Claude Biglet from the Swiss Parliament. My question will be about the coordination of the international aid. I was last year in Niger with our Foreign Affairs Ministry, one part dealing with peace process, the other with development cooperation. Met with uh, ICRC people, with World Food Organization, different embassies, the outcome which came from all those talks 
was that on one side there was a difficulty of coordination between the foreign agencies and the local government. On the other side, there was a difficulty of coordination between the people running development, agriculture, and the people doing short-term humanitarian activities. So the question is, how could we improve that coordination? Because everybody has the same target, but the way how it is done is sometimes a little bit chaotic. Equally, when I met the people dealing, of course, with the security or the people with the refugees, uh, we had completely different speeches. For example, in the case of Niger, <coughs> They would block the people at the border in the north to avoid that they cross the Sahara and move. Mm. So that was also European, but they had nothing to see and pretty uncoordinated with what was done for the internal refugees. Okay. My question is how to coordinate. Peter, let, why don't you try and begin to tackle that? Well, I think uh, from the perspective of the ICRC and as a part of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, uh, first and foremost, our first addressee are the national uh, societies uh, which we support, which are auxiliaries of the government and which are basically uh, a set of response which ideally is complementary to what the state does, what uh, international other international agencies do. Uh, I, I'm never 100% sure whether the key issue is about coordination. Uh, my experience in a place like Mali is also that there are places where everybody is and there are a lot of places where there are not so many actors. And I think that's the big problem. Uh, we try to be where others are not. And I think when you are the ICRC, you are very much at the front line of many organizations working with the national society to try to deliver in the most fragile context and situations social services to people as long as the state has not the capacity and the reach in certain regions to go there. Ideally, otherwise, we are not there. And I do understand there is an international health, uh, an international aid system which functions differently. But I wanted to make a point. I can't speak about the UN and the NGO movement, but I want to make a point that our first addressee in all the issues is the state structure and the national society. I mean, our engagement on security is with the armed forces and the police forces of Mali. And with the detention authorities of Mali, that's where we deliver our mandate. In assistance, it's the National Society to, live, uh, to, uh, to deliver services. But I, I compassion with Kamisa, who has to mm -hmm. juggle 19 framework, which basically say the same. Right. But my shock in going to Mali is maybe the flip side of Kamisa's, is when I land in Gao, I see... 200 plates of international organization who seem to be there. Right. And when I go to the city, I don't see anybody. Let's get one more question, and then maybe um, Kamisa can tackle that, that issue that, uh, in the previous question. Let's get the last, yeah, probably time for this question. Yeah, thank it. you very much. Uh, um, I'm the African Union Special Envoy um, dealing with women, peace, and security. I recently visited, um, because the Sahel is very important for us, uh, with the UN, um, the Deputy Secretary General, we visited uh, Chad, and we saw the Lake Chad, but seen the shrinking that you have shown. Um, we went also to the northern Nigeria and other places, and uh, Niger, just to see um, the resilience of the communities and uh, ICRC is also helping a lot. So we, at the African Union, we support very much the G5 Sahel project because it's mm. uh, the member states that are involved. But what we realize as well is that uh, it's not sufficient to have a military only because we need to address some of the issues. And here I think uh, maybe Madame Kamara, 
we'll have a time to talk about the international community, but also the private sector. When I look at the issue of the lake chart, the solutions, and ICRC have designed some of the solutions and we need to look at it. There is a possibility to bring the water down um, to the people. We need to invest. Why would you talk about only China and others? In, you know, we have innovative manners to do that. Electrification, I mean, those countries are rich, rich. And we need to invest on those. They are rich on people, they are rich on natural resources, and there is a way to do. We ha they have sun, the solar, the energy. We realize that a lot can be done to transform um, the, uh, the entire landscape. Um, and um, when I look at the women and the young people, the health issue, education, you know, we look into the uh, even the Islamic um, uh, fundamentalists, but um, we say that bring the women to teach the Quran, for example. We are supporting some madrasas to do that, to support that the women can sit, but doing also health issues with the community as well. So we have a lot of solutions and the international community, but private sector that are in Davos. And I think, um, Mr. Peter Moore, you need to bring the private sector within the, in the community to make sure that the resilience that you are doing, but okay. with the government, we can respond to the people's need. Minimize. I talk about Wrongly water. Wrongly this morning, <laughs> as you may have heard. Uh, uh, quite tirelessly because I'm deeply convinced uh, that uh, it is of critical importance. This is a fragility situation in which you, may, you can't leave it to humanitarians to deal with it. You have first, as Misa has said, you have to energize local communities and you have to bring private capital from outside in order to kickstart sure. certain of the positive developments which are happening on the ground and which are uh, very encouraging and which it really motivated me also to be such a strong advocate for private engagement in this region. I think we have about a minute left. So Minister, you, you see a big role for the private sector as well? I see a big role for everybody. Um, the state cannot do everything. Um, the, state has his, the state's main mission are to make sure that there is security, mm. that there is stability, that social services are uh, closer to the population, that people are, have the um, environment to go about and uh, do whatever they can to have a, a future. Um, there is space for everyone. Private sector is, is one of them. Uh, we're encouraging, for example, young people uh, who have ideas to become entrepreneurs because the state cannot provide enough jobs for all of them. Um, and again, there is space for everybody. It's not even, like you said, coordination necessarily, um, but for everybody to understand what each other is doing. I know what you're doing, so I'm not doing the same thing just to write a nice report. I'm doing something that will complement mm -hmm. what you're doing. Uh, in order to have actual results on the ground. That's what we're uh, okay. trying to aim at. Let's leave it there. Um, I think it was a, a fascinating conversation. Um, I thank you, a big thank you to the three panelists, also to Gabrielle O'Donnell, who's from the CREATE Lab at Carnegie Mellon for, um, for the work that he's done on the, on the uh, visualizations. And thank you to um, you for being attentive and, and good questions. So uh, thank our panelists. Great.